第三部。The moderator of Part Three is Acting Director General at the Jaya, and in Part Three, we will take up reconciliation and nationalism as a theme, and there will be five speakers. And let me introduce the panelists. First is from Keio University, Professor Yuichi Hosoya, and. He is an expert in post-war、uh, politics as well as British uh, uh, foreign affairs history. Next to him is、uh, from Taiwan uh, uh, Institute of Taiwan History Academia Sinica, Mr. Lung Ji Chang, and uh, uh, he is uh, uh, researching social and cultural history and colonialism. Next to him、uh, from George Washington University, Associate Professor Da Ching Yang, and、uh, he is. Uh, an expert in the contemporary history and the、uh, historiography of the Asia Pacific War, and from、uh, Sejong University, Professor Yu Ha Park,、uh, expert on、uh, the Japanese-Korean relationship, and then finally from the University of Tokyo、uh, Graduate School of Arts and Sciences,、uh, Professor Shin Kawashima, and、uh, he, his expertise is East Asia. And uh, uh, now I would like to hand over the microphone to the moderator. Thank you for the introduction. I am I from Jaya, and uh, I would uh, like to start the discussion for panel three. And as was introduced, we have five、uh, panelists here, and they will be speaking ten minutes each. And then after that, there will be a discussion among the panelists as well as the Q and A between the panelists and the audience. So,、uh, first is Professor Hosoya. Thank you very much. My name is Hosoya of Keio University. First of all, I would like to express my appreciation for your invitation to this symposium. It is a difficult but very important topic: this history and reconciliation. In this session, I would like to focus my attention. Well, since this、uh, session is reconciliation and nationalism. Since I specialize in the history of Europe and political science, from these two perspectives, politics and history, I would like to consider what reconciliation is all about. Well, this is the final session, and you may be tired by now. I saw many people leaving this conference room, but still, many of you are here, which is. Evidence of the criticality of this issue, and many of you are、uh, seem to be very interested in this topic, which delights me greatly. Now, since this morning, from various perspectives,、uh, we have been discussing、uh, this topic of reconciliation from various perspectives, and I think、uh, many factors have already been covered. But what has not been fully covered, although some speakers had referred to this. Well, at least I think that in-depth discussion did not take place in relation to international politics. When we think about reconciliation, we have to think about what power is all about, because power politics is what international politics is all about, and thus so. The power politics is the basis of international politics, and Professor Winnichukan talked about justice. And so, in the area of international politics, power would have to be considered together with justice. So there is the struggle over power and struggle over justice in this international,、uh, the world of international politics, and how this power and justice is correlated is very important to think about. So to give you the conclusion, with the changing relationship of power. This recognition of history, or even our memory, would be affected and would be changed. So, to be more specific, currently in the world, 
There is this transformation of the power balance. Many people talk about the change of power balance. So, up to now, there was this international order, this which was based on the Western values, but with the emerging nations coming to acquire greater capability and power, and the uh, India and China in this region have come to acquire greater political capability, and they have greater power. So with the balance of power changing, the recognition of justice would also change. And as Dr. Kitaoka in his keynote speech mentioned, after World War II, this peace settlement and through the peace conference, there was this peace treaty that was concluded. And in the peace treaty, as principle, justice is to be embedded, but this is to be done by the victor of the world. So this uh, power of the world, the victor of world war, uh, has in the history embedded justice in the peace treaty. Now, if we see this transformation of the international order, this means that the recognition of justice also would be affected. Up to now, the Western values, the Western norms, and Western justice had been embedded in this peace treaty, but this is now collapsing. And as a result of that, this traditional understanding of justice have come to be criticized. So for example, between Japan and China or Japan and South Korea, Japan overwhelmingly used to be powerful in terms of economy and uh, in other areas. Uh, so justice was not necessarily an issue between Japan and China or Japan and Korea, but well, at least uh, in the relative uh, status of Japan was superior. However, the recognition of history would be affected by the changing balance of power and in the past five or ten years or after the end of the Cold War, the recognition of history was affected by the change of the power balance. And so Japan in the United Nations was treated as a vanquished nation, a defeated nation. And Japan had lost part of its justice. But uh, Japan had proactively uh, embraced uh, this new international order that was incorporated in the Japanese constitution, including the rule of law, democracy, and various values. But part of the justice that was lost uh, by Japan being defeated in World, World, World War II was to be recovered uh, among the nationalistic people in this country. And the liberal people were more open to this loss of justice as a result of Japan's defeat in the war. Now, what Japan lost in the post-war period uh, were to be recovered, according to some. But uh, it was not Japan that thought that uh, justice was lost. People's Republic of China was founded in 1949, and in the previous year, in 1948, the Republic of Korea uh, had been founded, and uh, they did not take part in the drafting of the peace treaty, and they did not attend an official capacity in the San Francisco Peace Conference. And so if the post-war justice and order was to be established as a result of these peace conferences and peace treaty, China nor Korea couldn't take part in that. So it's not just Japan that considered the loss of justice, but China and Korea couldn't make full assertion on these occasions. So in East Asia, Japan, China, and South Korea in the past couldn't embed this justice. And this, the, the people in these countries want to realize these justice. 
but as mentioned by several speakers today, in the past there was this Cold War and there was this strategic necessity of these countries that did not allow the people of these countries uh, to recover justice. And under the leadership of the United States in this Cold War environment, Japan and Korea had to cooperate for strategic reasons. So temporarily, this uh, conflict or dispute over the recognition of history was shelved. And in 1978, there was the Sino-Japanese Peace and Friendship Treaty, and the United States, which was the hegemony from the eyes of China, required cooperation. But the strategic environment had changed and the international orders have changed and there is this new trend in this international politics. The change of the power balance, I believe, is making this issue of the recognition of history more difficult and the assertions turning to be more radical. I feel that this has not been pointed out sufficiently. Well, Ian Belner-Yuda, uh, who moved on to Princeton U uh, University, had talked about the lack of mention of power when historians talked about history, which I think is very important. So then, what is the option for Japan? Because of various rationale, each country, if they make assertions of justice, uh, there will be this conflict of justice. Now, five years ago, International Order was a book that I described, and balance of power and concert of power and the community of power are the three different types of power. And not only power, but justice in terms of striking a balance uh, to have concert and to create a community, justice is required. And if a community is to be formed in Asia, that's very difficult to succeed. But if we are to have this concert or uh, to have this balance, that would be a different story. So while Japan asserts its own justice, the justice of other countries, because China has their own justice and Korea has their own justice, first of all, Japan should try to understand the Chinese and Korean justice respectively and to harmonize and seek concert of these concepts so that a shareable justice may be created. But history, as mentioned several times, would be based on this historical fact, not just this strategic motivation or political motivation to interpret the history. It has to be based on facts hard facts. So based on these set of facts, justice as well as order would have to be created in this Asian Pacific region. And nationalism has come to flourish after the Cold War. And in order to avoid drifting, I believe this mindset is very important. Now, Professor Chang. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Long Chi Chang from Academia Seneca, Taiwan. And it's my great pleasure to attend this very important and prestigious symposium on history and reconciliation. Instead of theoretical reasoning, I will try to uh, offer in the following remarks some concrete examples of contemporary Taiwan-Japan relations and try to respond to the theme of reconciliation and nationalism from a Taiwanese uh, historian's viewpoints. Unlike many textbook ex examples, Taiwan is a post-colonial society that underwent several regimes in the past 400 years. 
to be sure, the development of Taiwanese nationalism is characterized by three major features, namely discontinuous state-building efforts, multiple waves of in immigration, and the contingent geopolitical circumstances. With this historical background in mind, let's take a closer look at Taiwan-Japan re reconciliation. For many Japanese, Taiwan has been a remote and obscure place that is famous for maybe for her baseball team, national scenery, or delicious cuisine. It was actually not until 2011 when Taiwanese donations and charity efforts in Japan's great 311 earthquake that has all number other countries in the world that led to the new recognition and attention of Japanese society for her former colony and, and result in a robust and positive exchange between the two countries. So how do, we, do, how do people in contemporary Taiwan view the legacy of Japanese colonialism? I will try to outline the following five major trends in Taiwan for your reference. The first trend is to rediscover Taiwan's colonial past and the collective experience of the Japanese-speaking Taiwanese generation. This colonial legacy of Japan has become new inspiration for younger generation of Taiwanese filmmakers and artists such as Wei Desheng, who endeavors to offer their reflections on Taiwanese post-colonial history and Taiwan-Japan relations. Uh, we, Director Wei Desheng, the series of award-winning works, not only broke back new box office, but attract new interest in understanding the island's colonial history. The second trend is to reevaluate the pioneering efforts of J Japanese scholars and their intellectual legacies in Taiwan. To be sure, with the rise of Taiwan studies since the lifting of martial law in the 1980s, New scholarships on Japanese colonialism no longer subscribe to the anti-Japanese ideology and instead try to provide solid empirical works from a Taiwan-centered perspective. After 30 years of collective efforts, Taiwan study has become a full-fledged discipline on the island and also received recognition from the international academia. So based on the archival studies and with new perspective, Scholars begin to reevaluate progressive Japanese colonial officials such as Kodo Shinpei and Nitobe Inazo, and also try to commemorate and reflect on the important intellectual works on Taiwan history and political economy by scholars like Ino Kanori and Yanehara Tadao. The third important trend is that following the rethinking of the question of colonial modernity in Taiwan, this trend has led to the transformation of former Japanese colonial sites to local cultural heritage. Since mid-1990s, many Japanese sites and architectures were no longer perceived as poisonous uh, Japanese legacy, but were designated as historical monument or hi all historical buildings. These new heritage sites rep represent new political, cultural, and economic trends of localism in post-colonial Taiwan. The bond between memory and place inspire grassroots initiatives of conservation and trigger a new sense of community and civil awareness towards a new vision of a well-inhabited homeland. This, represent, re, this reinterpretation of former Japanese colonial sites as a new symbol of locality and Taiwanese subjectivity constitute one of the very unique case of post-colonial memory politics. For example, former Taiwan Sodokfu Museum and Tainan local government building were transformed into a public facilities such as National Taiwan Museum and National Museum of Taiwan Literature. The fourth trend in post-colonial Taiwan is to retell the complex human stories of Taiwanese suffering, Taiwanese sufferings during the World War II for contemporary younger generation readers. As discussed in Professor Kitakawa's keynote speech this morning, it is estimated that a total of 200,000 Taiwanese participated in the war from 1937 to 1945 and the death toll was estimated to be around 
30,000 people. It was only until 1990s that these diverse, divergent, and often fragmented memories and the microhistories of suburban Taiwanese, men and women alike, during World War II, resurfaced from oblivion through oral history, collective biography, personal memoirs, and documentary films done by NGO workers and public historians. Last but not least, the fifth and ongoing efforts in contemporary Taiwan is the re-envisioning re of new history education that tr try to transcend official ideology and political divisiveness. In brief, the post-colonial reframing of Taiwan's colonial past involved new recognition of their contested nature, engagement of controversial voices, and discovery of attached historical memory, using this as a base to try to reinterpret the Japanese colonial legacy from a contemporary Taiwanese viewpoint. This, the, this case of Taiwan uh, decolonization process offers an alternative vision that does not emphasize simply condemn or to erase things Japanese, but try to promote civil awareness, social welfare, environmental concern, or even economic improvement through, through reconnection, negotiation, and re reinterpretation of the uh, Taiwan's colonial legacy. So what can we learn from the above examples and further reflect on the issue of reconciliation and nationalism in contemporary East Asia and the world? As everybody knows, nationalism plays a significant role in bringing people together and removing differences among them. But at the same time, nationalism can also be used, as many of our speakers rightly pointed out, an instrument of dividing the world in different camps and groups. It has helped create feelings of love and assimilation for fellow human beings, but at the same time, it can also sow the seeds of hatred, enmity, and intolerance among the people belonging to different races, regions, and sects. So uh, let me try to quote one of the leading uh, scholars of nationalism, Tom Nering, uh, in his recent work entitled The Modern Genesis of Nationalism. Nering argued for a democratic necessity of na nationalism in contemporary uh, world, while insisting that nationalism is an in inescapable as ever. He shows how its forms and content are constantly shifting. The ethnic definition of the nation is giving gradually, gradually giving to the civic, the natural, to the design. Nering believes that today's nationalism should and can be a more civic and secular one. And this will be a key feature of modernity and not an archaic reaction against it. So in contrast, to many uh, post-colonial societies and also the developments, uh, including like China, Korea, and other regions in Asia, Africa, or even Latin America, Taiwanese nationalism is never a linear process of anti-imperialist struggle followed by, by the establishment of a nation state. With the coexistence of different ethnic groups, nation-building effort in Taiwan is by definition a balancing act, a delicate balancing act of democratization and multiculturalism. And the situation is further complicated by the lack of international recognition since 1970s and, the diffi and Taiwan's difficult diplomatic status and unresolved sovereignty issue. So by way of conclusion, I would like to make the following three very general, if not uh, amateur statements. First of all, due to its highly emotional nature and exclusive tendency, nationalism is often a preventing factor of reconciliation. However, for those weak nation and marginal groups, like Taiwan or Taiwanese people, nationalism can also play a very positive role as promoting post-colonial 
Taiwan-Japan relations. Secondly, when viewed from a post-colonial and transnational perspective, nationalism can also be a catalyst for democratic consolidation and new envisioning of multicultural society. Finally, to rethink nationalism as genus, we therefore need to focus more on its positive role in peacemaking and conflict resolution that can bridge the gaps between different groups, nations, states, and help us move collectively from a connected history to a shared history. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Chan. Next, I should like to call upon Professor Yang. Um, good afternoon. I'd like to thank uh, Goku Munken for inviting me to this very important symposium. I'm also very happy to take over the mic from my um, graduate school classmate. Um, I will start also by uh, discussing nationalism. And my point here is we need to look at it historically and comparatively. Um, in the case of Western Europe, where nas modern nationalism first um, originated, uh, the two devastating world wars, World War I, World War II, had largely discredited ultranationalism for countries like France, Germany. And I think that's an important background also to keep in mind of their post-war reconciliation. Whereas um, in East Asia, nationalism had a different trajectory. Let's not forget that Japan, modern Japan, Meiji Japan, was the pioneer of modern nation building. And from that, many Asian nationalists learned from Japan. Um, but at the same time, the rest of Asia had their own nation building project delayed as a result of Western colonialism, but also as Japanese colonialism. So we need to keep modern contemporary nationalism in this historical context in the sense that for those countries who move out of colonialism, there is a certain historical legitimacy for nationalism. I think as uh, um, Professor Zhang Longzhi mentioned in the case of Taiwan, uh, but to a certain extent, if you look at China, you could say that their nation building, nation building efforts was derailed because of World War II to the point that we have a Taiwan, we have a mainland China. And also with the case of Korea, we have a North Korea and South Korea. So it's important to understand the appeal of nationalism, not only as an elite phenomenon, but also as a phenomenon attractive to the public. And we can also look at Europe. In Eastern Europe, in Baltic countries, after the fall of the Soviet Union, we also see a new nation building effort. Of course, that has some problematic um, aspects uh, with it. But thankfully, in the case of Europe, we have this umbrella of European community that to some extent can contain some of the more uh, detrimental effect of communi uh, nationalism. And finally, even in advanced democracies, nationalism can resurge as a backlash against globalism, globalization. So last year, we had Brexit, we had election of Donald Trump, we have the AFD in Germany. So we need to uh, look at this in a historical and comparative way. So second, when it comes to reconciliation between Japan and China, we already heard uh, a very good presentation from Professor Her. I just like to offer a few additional remarks. Um, I consider the first half of the post-war period between People's Republic China and Japan to have experienced something like a thin reconciliation as opposed to the deep or thick reconciliation. And in addition to the factors Professor He talked about, namely the Cold War, uh, geopolitical consideration, I want to add also the element of ideology. Uh, maybe because I'm a little bit older than Professor He, I remember distinctly as a elementary school student, we were told to remember class struggle, class based bitterness against domestic enemies, class enemies. 
represented by Chiang Kai-shek and, uh, and, and so on. So in that sense, nationalism in this period was somewhat curtailed under this revolutionary ideology that also has an element of internationalism. I think that's an important context to take into consideration. And on top of that, we also have a very strong state. Uh, so for people who think that uh, you know, in autocratic or totalitarian society, reconciliation is hard to pursue, the paradox is that under the strong leadership of Mao, there was this thin reconciliation between Japan and China. Now, of course, this thin reconciliation unraveled uh, after 1980s or 90s especially, and why? Um, in addition to the changing Cold War uh, dynamic, the end of the Cold War, the geopolitical uh, uncertainty, the power transition that has been mentioned, what is also important is that China itself experienced a dramatic ideological shift, abandoning communism, revolution, class analysis to what we may describe as a normal country, where nationalism, patriotism seem to be a very legitimate uh, goal. Of course, I'm not denying that the state, the party, make use of this, but we should also not overlook the fact that there is a ground swelling sort of acceptance uh, of such a narrative. And also it's important to keep in mind that as a result of the opening and reform, the Chinese society, which had been virtually silent and voiceless under Mao, are beginning to speak out. I think Professor Herb made that point as well. And also outside China, we should keep in mind with the end of the Cold War, there is a global memory culture. Uh, to the point I think this year's Nobel Prize in Literature selected an author whose main theme is memory. Um, so again, in a comparative way, uh, China may or may not be that unique in sort of harnessing the history or looking at the history uh, in order to find its uh, you know, present identity. So let me wrap up uh, by offering some uh, thoughts on how to move forward in this age of resurgent nationalism with the goal of promoting uh, reconciliation. So we need to be realistic. Um, we need to think of build, creating building blocks for the deep uh, reconciliation that many have talked about. The first, I think we should harness sort of the positive dynamics in the East Asia region that has been brought about, being brought about by economic growth and inter interdependence and increasing social interaction. Um, regrettably, the, the, the dynamic that uh, had been moving forward in the early 2000s have somewhat um, stalled on the interstate level. Um, and also we should pay attention to the domestic diversity in all three countries. Um, even though the voice of nationalists tend to grab headlines, but the reality is more complex in all three countries. So that creates space for dialogue and exchange. And here as a historian, I would like to emphasize that we need to work together to counterbalance the nationalist narrative. Uh, from the uh, parallel history that has been mentioned, we should also make efforts to decenter the nation state to embrace uh, what has been already mentioned, the transnational history, global history, as a changing way to look at the past to relativize uh, this nation state. And finally, to echo uh, Professor Lily Gardner-Feldman, one of the principles of reconciliation is cross-border uh, institutions at both state and society level. And here, again, as a historian, I would like to echo uh, the point about uh, strengthening exchange and dialogue among historians. Um, in the last several years, I have done a project in Europe to look at various historians' commissions, and which really surprised me, both in terms of the number of historian commissions in Europe and also the length. In other words, for example, Germany has open-ended dialogue with Czech Republic, with Russia, since the early 1990s. 
So what I see is that in East Asia, or maybe even larger, we need a long-term, independent, and open platform for historians to exchange views. Um, in this case, I uh, some, uh, agree with uh, Professor Kitaoka's point that it's important to include third party or outsiders, but I also feel that East Asian historians should be the main uh, uh, actors uh, in this such a platform. And the second, I think it's high time we build a network of history educators in East Asia. Uh, in Europe, we have something called EuroCLEO. It's a you know, supranational organization consisting of history educators. And one problem with the history uh, dialogue, as Professor Kitaoka mentioned, is it's not reflected in the history education. Um, so I think with uh, efforts like this, they are not going to bring about historical reconciliation immediately. Of course not. But I think they should be part of the any action plan. And I hope uh, you will uh, have some comments on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yan. Now, may I call on Professor Park? Hi, Thank you very much. As you may know, and as included in my introduction, I have published a book about comfort women. And as a result of authoring this book, there were quite a few people who tried to avoid me. And uh, I am very grateful that Jaya had invited me to this symposium. So I have prepared a resume in Japanese, and I would like to give my presentation along this line. As I have listened to the discussion throughout the day, I have come to realize many things. Although it is not included in the resume, the point that I would like to relate to you is research on history is important and to know the facts of what had happened in the fa past is important, but what was lacking was what had happened in the past, what is happening currently. To know the facts and to try to understand the background was not seriously worked upon. We didn't make enough effort. As a result, uh, we had been fooled, if you will, by these uh, fallacies and, uh, about the history. Now, the theme of the symposium is history and reconciliation. Twelve years ago, I wrote this book for reconciliation, and I took up this issue of textbook comfort mo uh, women, the Yasukuni shrine visit, and territorial issues. And uh, the part, uh, some people who read the book who, uh, became highly critical. And. Reconciliation is not to pretend nothing had happened in the past or like water under the bridge. That is not what reconciliation means. But many people have come to associate this word reconciliation, at least uh, in people that surround me, that it has a very negative connotation. So I became very reluctant to use this word reconciliation. Because originally, this word was supposed to have this very positive and promising implication. And uh, so I think this is a very important meeting. Already, uh, mention about comfort women has uh, been made already between Japan and Korea. This is an issue. And uh, the textbook issue 
that I took up in the book is not necessarily a hot topic, but there is this forced labor issue and also the victims of the great Kanto earthquake coming from Korea. There are new research papers published, so maybe this is going to be uh, one of the controversial issues in the future between the two countries. And uh, the comfort women issue was supposed to have been settled, but still this is a point of conflict between the two countries. So I'd like to briefly touch on this. So number two in my resume gives you an overview of the conflict between Japan and Korea over comfort women. And uh, uh, allow me to briefly uh, read what I have written here. Uh, so in 1991, this became an issue uh, as uh, it was voiced by the comfort women in Korea who were still surviving. And then uh, the government-led uh, Asian Women's Fund was established, uh, which is an attempt of the Japanese government uh, to settle matters related to history between the two countries. However, uh, some people in Korea strongly resisted that this was really uh, superficial and not sincere to try to settle this issue uh, by the founding of the Asian Women's Fund. And there was this backlash and rejection by the support groups of the comfort women in Korea. And only 60 people out of 238 just accepted the apology and indemnification by the Japanese government. And this was not reported by the media in Korea and for a long time just the voices of the support group in Korea uh, was the source of information for the Korean mass media and this became the recognition and understanding of the Korean people. The settlement between Japan and Korea towards the end of 2015 was in reality the second round of attempt by the Japanese government to recompensate and apologize once again. But there is still strong objection in the people among the people in Korea that uh, this strong uh, this official reparation is yet to be extended and uh, many people in Korea thinks that uh, the comfort women who accepted the apologies and compensation was placated but the truth is that at the moment uh, this is the understanding of the Korean media and the recognition of the general public in Korea and in December 2011, as the symbol of protest, and in the back of the bronze statue, there is uh, this line that uh, is a line of protest against the Japanese government, and this was established in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul. And the reason why the Korean government cannot remove this statute is because uh, this is going to really trigger a strong refute and backlash among the people in Korea. So this issue of comfort women is really a long source of conflict between the two countries. And uh, the people of two countries had a very severe conflict in terms of their emotion. And especially in recent years, uh, the anti-Korean sentiment among the Japanese public is really mounting and deteriorating further. As mentioned already today, Superficially, it is considered as this conflict of nationalism, but it's only the uh, limited number of leftists and extreme rightists who are really affecting this logic. In other words, the origin of the conflict goes back to the colonial years uh, Korea placed under Japanese rule, and there needs to be a clear understanding. While Japanese uh, was ruling Korea, 
The leftist was, of course, resistance against this imperialism and this collective memory is affecting the movement in Korea. And currently, this is led, well, in Korea, towards the end of 80s, democratization movement became quite successful. And uh, people who led this movement are now taking initiative. And uh, since then, the pro-Japanese Koreans were considered to be controlling the society. And uh, it's only 30 years since such concept or perception had taken root in the Korean society. And North Korea, that is trying to legitimize itself, fighting against the Imperial Japanese Army. And uh, the United States and Japan being considered still as an imperious nation is also based on a similar concept. Many Koreans just rely on the interpretation of the history or the recognition of history of a limited number of historians. And Japanese people sometimes just criticize in a very generalized manner that many in Korea are anti-Japanese. Well, after the liberation, uh, Korea was a nation that was anti-communist. But after that, uh, we had this military dictatorship. And uh, so there was not enough opportunity given to the people in the country to reflect on the years where Korea was under this uh, colonial rule. And so naturally, there was a struggle for democratization and uh, the exchange between the liberal people between Con uh, Korea and Japan uh, was more vigorous. And this is not just an issue of Korea. The research on comfort women was more or less led by Japanese scholars and Japanese people in general. And this issue has continued for more than 20 years without reaching a saddle satisfactory settlement. And many people had difficulty changing and transforming the substance and nature of their movement and research. And uh, the target of criticism was not just imperialism, uh, but Tenoism, the emperor system. So uh, the apology extended by modern Japan, as long as the emperor system is sustained, is just superficial, according to some in Korea. And uh, such political doctrine is about to be succeeded to the next generation in Korea. So what is important is not just information, but knowledge, wisdom, and attitude needs to be shared, or at least understood. And uh, there are some foreign perspective uh, that is becoming more conspicuous on the comfort women. I have a separate material that I have printed out uh, for your reference. And there are quite a few people uh, in Korea who considers the rule of Japan as a good thing, not necessarily bad. And of course, uh, the ordinary people who led ordinary lives have been placed under the rule of Japan and there has to be this consideration of what constitutes a good acceptable control and rule. Now 20 years after the end of Cold War for the first time 
post-colonialism became quite conspicuous, allowing people to think about other issues such as comfort women and the recognition and perception also changed. But the victims and the victimizers were not clearly delineated in some cases, and it was quite complicated. I refer to this as post-colonialism that requires further research. And I'd like to skip some of the points in my resume. We need various factors to be taken into account in the wisdom of the historian as well as the knowledge and wisdom that is shown would have to be tackled in a certain way and how we are to work on these information and wisdom is very important for us to think about. Thank you. Finally, Professor Kashima, please. Thank you very much. I am studying uh, the diplomatic history of China, and my name is Kashima. And uh, it is a difficult matter, but uh, I would like to talk about history and nationalism. First, four points will be raised. First of all, the issue surrounding the perception of history, there is a uh, historic nature to that. And uh, with regards to the building of the nation state in East Asia in during the Meiji period or the Xin uh, period, there is a narrative uh, that is made and there is a certain exclusivity where there already was criticism of uh, surrounding countries, and that being the case, at least up from around 1910, uh, there has been the issue of textbooks. And in 1920s and 30s, with regards to the history of uh, books and the facts in them, uh, there have been uh, the uh, quarrel between the two countries. And uh, this is attached to my uh, material in English. And so uh, there is a very long uh, history in, uh, in the background. First, we need to keep this in mind. And in the 1980s, uh, it did not just suddenly start. It has been a very long-standing issue. And uh, secondly, it is uh, filled with modernity, a contemporary nature. This is not going to stop, rather. Depending on the age and situation, uh, there are changes, whether it be the issues or how the problem is. Uh, it's been changing, and also uh, the Japanese stance will change if it's pre-war times. The Japanese side uh, criticized the Chinese side for the anti-Japanese textbook, and uh, this is from 1910. So in this way, there have uh, always been uh, changes, and it is something uh, that is, you could say, um, living and changing. And in the reconciliation, it is not that uh, uh, the oppressor side does something and it ends. It, it might uh, be uh, continuing for maybe not uh, eternity, but for a long time. And thirdly, uh, this is international as well as the domestic issue, as mentioned by others, that uh, there are uh, the uh, complex relationship with the domestic issues. And what is important is uh, this history perception issue is, is not necessarily an independent variable in some cases. For example, textbook, what is written in the textbook might be the same, but one time it will lead to a problem, one time not. And uh, we've already seen this uh, trend from pre-war times. So it seems that there are a chain of incidents. And uh, well, Professor Hosea talked about power, and this is uh, related to what he said. Fourth has to do with the complex nature, and uh, this is related to the third uh, point, um, uh, territorial issues and 
well, inclusive of the Taiwan issue, uh, uh, lots of uh, aspects are entangled in the uh, history issue, and it becomes very complex. And that is uh, becoming conspicuous, and that is also uh, related to the domestic and international aspect. But that can be a characteristic. So uh, that is uh, four characteristics that I have just mentioned. And the uh, next, uh, well, I can continue to talk about the history, but I'm going to limit my talk to post-war time. So the uh, colonialism age ended, and the war ended. And how has this been dealt with? Uh, from pre-war times, there have been issues. But, uh, for example, if it's China, then uh, the Japanese history education has been criticized uh, from the Chinese side. But uh, after the war, af well, what was changed was that uh, instead of uh, the term China, uh, we used the term China. So uh, they didn't have uh, enough uh, power to uh, change uh, the phrasing and wording. And uh, we, there was a mention of San Francisco earlier, that is the San Francisco Peace Treaty and the series of bilateral treaties. And with that, uh, well, this is a legal uh, processing of the issue. And so we have to be careful here at this stage. The countries of Asia had not been democratized at that point. Uh, Japan was democratized, but uh, whether it be Korea or uh, Taiwan or uh, China, they were not democratized. And uh, so in terms of the past reparations and the various treaties uh, regarding the past or the articles within those treaties, in the process of uh, decision, the big problem was that uh, the uh, parties were not uh, participating, and therefore, uh, we could say that, uh, well, there's been a legal settlement or uh, the treaty settlement, but uh, that logic will not uh, be effective uh, in uh, Asia. And also, uh, from 1980s to 1990s, uh, there is democratization which takes place. And in that process, what there was uh, originally the um, criticism of the uh, 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 authoritarian groups. And uh, uh, so uh, it is uh, easy to understand uh, and uh, to try to use the uh, settlement with treaties, but uh, uh, that does not uh, take effect. And then after the 1980s, that was the situation. And next is uh, uh, that being the situation, a key point is in the 1980s and 1990s, what Japan did is in uh, the legal fora to try to handle the history issue. And uh, 2006, 2007, the Supreme Court ruling has changed, so this is not done very much now. But if it's uh, 1990s, there's the Liu Lian uh, trial and uh, uh, the timing when uh, the uh, legal system functions. And uh, this is uh, backed up uh, by the uh, views of the people, and uh, the judicial system comes into play. And uh, that, after the 21st century, it shows comes to a stop, and uh, it becomes uh, political, and uh, politi the politics comes to the fore. Uh, there is, uh, for example, joint uh, research or uh, uh, the public uh, discussion, and also at the same time, uh, this is not just about Japan, but rather China and Korea, uh, um, Koguryo issue, or uh, between China and Taiwan, uh, there is still uh, history issues. And also, uh, the Asian countries, as they democratize within the various countries, uh, the uh, history issues become uh, more complex in terms of uh, the domestic history. And now, with regards to the uh, Japan and China then, uh, what about uh, Japan and China? Well, uh, initially, uh, uh, we had recognized Taiwan, and uh, uh, in terms of the perception of history, there was the 50-year colonial rule and also uh, the uh, issue of the war between um, uh, Japan and Taiwan. It was supposed to have been discussed uh, with Chiang Kai-shek, but there was the martial law and uh, uh, suppression. And so uh, 
eat our bao yan was the term used. In other words, uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's words uh, were used to try to control history, to use virtue to uh, deal with uh, this, uh, gr these grudges. And then between Japan and uh, uh, China, there is the Japan-Chinese friendship and uh, for uh, they said that uh, the uh, responsibility is not with the people, but rather uh, some parts of the military. Chiang Kai-shek said this, and also Mao Zedong. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping in uh, 1980, and as Professor Hostilia uh, referred to this, what happened was that in the 1980s, in terms of economy, we are to learn from uh, China. But at the same time, with regards to history, we, it's to be emphasized uh, Deng Xiaoping. And uh, uh, this is from before the textbook problem in the 1980s that uh, this was mentioned. And so to put, set up a museum in Nanjing as well as in uh, the site of the Marco Polo incident. And so you have uh, the two wheels of uh, the history and economy. And in the 80s, it was the two were linked. In other words, you had the history problem, but uh, on the economy side, for example, there are the yen loans and the consideration made there. And that would be a way to deal with the perception of history through foreign affairs. But as we enter the 1990s, uh, uh, very rapidly, there is no more learning uh, of, of economy from Japan. And that means that uh, uh, it is history that is emphasized. and. Uh, there is the uh, Murayama statement, and uh, then Cold War had ended, and the socialist countries uh, were collapsing, and so Chinese Communist Party uh, wanted to uh, just have uh, the legitimacy uh, rebuilt within uh, China, and therefore they were not so concerned uh, with Japan. And then after that, uh, there are joint uh, research of history between the two countries. In April of 2007, when Jiabao comes to Japan, and with regards to the historical issues, he highly evaluated the efforts being made in Japan. We had the Marayama statement and concessions, and, and there was also concessions on the Chinese side. So it is mutual, but the timing is, you could say, different. And that's how things are now. And as uh, we have been saying now, it is uh, very multifaceted. And uh, also, uh, from a global point of view, the issue is being viewed. As, in other words, uh, the perception of history to be viewed from uh, global uh, cases. And also, the Asian countries uh, uh, do have their own domestic history issues, uh, which are linked to their domestic problems. So it is a very difficult time that we are now entering and in. And one more thing uh, between Japan and China, because uh, there are so many people, experts on foreign affairs, uh, we may have the impression that uh, it's at a deadlock, but uh, uh, at least the dialogue between historians are taking place uh, in uh, abundance. In other words, there are so many joint uh, studies, and uh, it is on the levels of dozens of uh, joint research which is taking place, that's a fact. But the problem is that, uh, and as uh, Professor Park said in a resume, uh, there is uh, uh, the fruits on the common understanding among the histories, uh, but a division between uh, historians and society, the people, and uh, maybe the young scholars uh, may uh, uh, have come some understanding, uh, but uh, uh, and reconciliation. But what about on the uh, people's level and the national level? How is it recycled to that level? Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kawashima. Now, we had the first round of presentation by five panelists. We still have 30-some uh, minutes. So first, among the panelists, if you have any questions or comments to other panelists, uh, please feel free to take the floor. Or any points you'd like to confirm, this is the opportunity. Anyone? Yes, please. Thank you. Professor, uh, uh, to Professor Chan, my question, and to Professor Yan, uh, my comment. Recently, a certain person told me that the Drinking legal age is uh, 20 in Japan, and the Taiwan 18, and the Korea 19 years old. 
the difference between Taiwan and Korea, the difference is very interesting. And I appreciate your presentation about the background, and I learned very much from your presentation. In the relationship with China, in your relationship with China, maybe in the back uh, in the background, I just felt it that way. But there are uh, other decisive factors involved, and if there are such factors, uh, I like to invite uh, Professor Chan's comment. And uh, Professor Yam, you talked about thin. Uh, reconciliation. That is very interesting. I was uh, feeling in the same way. In 1990s, uh, there was a, a reconciliation effort between Korea and Japan through Asia Women's Fund. It failed, but that was a case of thin reconciliation, I think. And uh, there was a people's uh, donation activities uh, it may not be uh, it's sort of going, but um, we felt that the Japanese people in general had the sense of uh, apology and reflection, but that uh, sen uh, feeling uh, suffers from setback. The reason behind is, as I mentioned, the views of uh, leaders, maybe uh, in a way wishing for justice, but uh, some became uh, quite strident uh, and uh, pursuing the direction others cannot uh, join. So I agree with your uh, concept of thin uh, reconciliation. Now, Professor Chan. Uh, I, I myself is not, uh, uh, I didn't know that much about Korean history and Korean culture, uh, but before my uh, departure from Taiwan, uh, my daughter actually teamed up with her friends to uh, rush and lined up for a, a K-pop group who just came very shortly to Taipei to uh, meet with their uh, Taiwanese fan. So uh, I, think, I think this phenomenon, uh, the kind of the prevalent uh, popular culture between uh, Korea and Taiwan and also maybe in, in East Asia, is a new phenomena that uh, might offer a good vantage point to rethink about this uh, hard, very uh, difficult issues such as nationalism and, and reconciliation from a younger generation's viewpoint. And as for uh, the Taiwan-China relations, uh, since my, I myself is not a diplomatic historian, I think uh, Professor Kawashima's work has offered a lot of insights uh, I think one major point, which I didn't really mention in my presentation, uh, is that there actually exist two very different forms of historical memories in Taiwan, in contemporary Taiwan. One is for those who came with the KMT regime uh, from mainland China to Taiwan after 1949 or even earlier in 1945. They are so-called mainlander generation, and they now have the third uh, the second and third generations. And they have a great attachment, both uh, emotionally and also uh, physically, uh, with their relatives on the mainland. So this, this year is 2017. It marked the 30th anniversary of the, of the opening of cross-trade tourism and for, uh, in, in Taiwan. So that's part of the memory, which is more or less linked and connected to the so-called Republic of China in Taiwan. But there are also another uh, very important, if not um, now become more or less orthodox memory in Taiwan for those who, uh, whose ancestors um, migrated from mainland China or the south, southern China to Taiwan in uh, Qing period, maybe 100, 200 years ago, they underwent uh, the process of localization, and also, more importantly, underwent the Japanese colonial rule, and also the wartime, uh, uh, the war experience, and fight for Japan as a Japanese nationals. So these two very different, if not the opposite memory, coexist today, uh, and become the memory landscape of contemporary Taiwan. 
So that's, I think, uh, the, one of the major challenges for historical reconciliation, or if not uh, historical research and education, is how to reconcile these two very different but very real uh, memories, and also some how to find a, a kind of a political, institutional, and social and cultural ways to reconcile these two. And as I point out in my very uh, superficial presentation, you can see that there is actually a new trend uh, developing and, and since the lifting of martial law uh, in 1897, uh, uh, 18, uh, 1987. So uh, I think this, I myself is uh, more or less optimistic that uh, with the collective efforts and also a different uh, a different uh, a kind of cross-disciplinary efforts by a different generation of scholars. We should be able to, uh, to, to quote uh, Professor He's work, like to devise a kind of a conversion narrative instead of the combative, if not oppositional narratives for a new generation of readers. Thank you. Yang Dr. Yang. To say except to thank you. Um, I, I don't claim credit for this term thing, reconciliation, come from a philosopher. Uh, but I think there is some similarity to uh, uh, Professor Chenlani's. Uh, your title is the reconciliation without any process. And perhaps this is a concept that can be applied in even in other relationships, but we can discuss later. Um, and maybe if I can just no. add about this uh, Taiwan-China uh, relation. I mean, as often is the case, the, the building a strong national identity near, uh, needs the othering, the, the other, indispensable other. So you already raised this question, to what extent does China end up becoming the indispensable other for the Taiwanese nationalism? Um. Yeah, I think this is also a very interesting and if not very difficult question about uh, nationalism and the necessity of creating or if not essentializing an, another to uh, form, to become an instrument of identity politics. And I think uh, for, for as, a, as a Taiwanese historian who was educated uh, in the United States and also have other experienced uh, interact, interacting with other people, uh, scholars from other regions, I think this othering effect uh, can be overcome uh, by numerous uh, approaches. So uh, I, I, I would, uh, because uh, uh, for, for me, I myself, uh, didn't uh, hold any grudges against uh, Chinese or things Chinese in China. But younger generations, they, their um, view of China is actually uh, through textbooks and other channels like internet and others. So how can we create a new medium for information exchange and also a kind of a provide more uh, factual uh, factual information in addition to what uh, Professor Winichago just said, that we need a new pers perspective and attitude to digest and to think about and reflect and to incorporate this information and form our own historical consciousness. That would be a dual challenge for, I think, uh, people on the both sides of the, of the Taiwan Strait. Thank you. Kosmos uh, and Professor Kawashima, please. But if, they, if I may add, internal discussion in Taiwan is going to globalize. But uh, from the Chinese perspective, as mentioned, the uh, perception of history of the uh, party, the People's Party, uh, uh, is like, for example, the maturity incident or Xiao Chakai. 
uh, interpretation would have this common uh, perception between Taiwan and China. But that was what used to be the case in the past, but it is collapsing. So Sino-Japanese, since the Sino-Japanese war, there has been a change in the environment. And the perception of history of the people of Taiwan and the people's uh, perception of KMT uh, has to do with how the rule of Japan in Taiwan is to be evaluated and interpreted. And the four the Japanese people, the description about the Japanese rule uh, is, of course, a acceptable story and uh, the comfortable narrative. And uh, so there would be a commitment made uh, by the conservative people in Taiwan for this rule of uh, Taiwan in the past. I basically agree with what uh, Professor Kawashima has just said. And I, uh, as one of the leading uh, intellectual in the 1920s, Jiang uh, Weishui uh, said during that period, uh, he considered Taiwan not uh, only belongs to Japan or, uh, can, or trade can trace the origin back to China, but he envisioned the Taiwanese to be the bridge of the two countries and, and the region because due to its geographical and cultural and different kind of position, this kind of marginal positioning is actually an advantage for Taiwanese to be able to travel across different boundaries, not only include, including national boundary, but also cultural boundaries. And this peripheral status of Taiwan is, is not unique. I think uh, one of my a very small critique about the, the three country uh, uh, textbook is that it's actually still based on this, the notion of nation state or sovereign state. But there are many, many regions and peoples in Asia that cannot be subsumed by this categorization. For, 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 if you think from a cent center of viewpoints, then these are all uh, subversive or if not uh, divisive elements. But you, if you look at it from a global or comparative or more a kind of a, uh, this kind of perspective, this, uh, these subordinate groups and their experience, for example, the Okinawans in Japanese and the other minority groups in China, or even the indigenous people within Taiwan, they all have their own story and they, their voice cannot be subsumed by orthodox nationalist narrative. So uh, if we look at history from a more uh, open-minded perspective, then national history or nationalist history cannot and will not be the, be the only version for the 21st century. We need a, a kind of new vision for a connected history or a shared history if not a transnational global history. That's my viewpoint. Thank you. Well, I have a question to Professor Yan, I believe. And uh, I've listened to Taiwan Chinese, uh, the nationalism. And in this material. Oh, excuse the interpreter. This is a question to Dr. Park. And uh, you mentioned that recently uh, some people in other countries in the world have come to raise questions about how this issue of comfort women is taken up in Korea as well as in Japan. And in the past year or so, attending these international conferences, I never experienced criticism being raised on how Japan have dealt with the comfort women issue. Uh, far back in the past, how Japan had uh, 
dealt with this historical issue was criticized, but I think the international community have come to evaluate that uh, Japan have made effort to seek settlement with Korea and reach an agreement. So this uh, issue, uh, or rather uh, the source of threat, is now North Korea. And because of the strategic necessity, of course, comfort women is an issue that needs to be settled. But if DPRK is to fire a nuclear missile targeting South Korea, the importance of security arrangement among these countries in this region is more important. So in terms of priority, comfort women issue without any military threat that may have high priority. But right now, for Korea, I think the North Korean threat and the nuclear development threat, as well as how the Trump administration would approach Korea for alliance. And also, uh, there is this issue of the North Korean threat affecting China to stop imports and uh, so it's not possible for Korea to pay full attention to the comfort women. Of course, this problem would not go away. It exists. But internally, uh, the priority as a political issue and a societal issue, I think because of the global environment that changes quite dynamically, the priority would be affected. So going forward, what Korea should do has great relevance on what Japan needs to do. And uh, so under the new president, Moon Jae-in, uh, you have this liberal administration. So you talk about this foreign criticism raised on this comfort women handling in Korea. So part of the support group of comfort women in your country has directly been taken up by the mass media, becoming the mainstream voice in Korea. You raised the question, but what happens in the future? Is it like a pendulum? And is it going to go back to what used to be in the past? Or what do you think would be uh, the situation in the future? Priority no Sorry, change in priority. I think it's as you say. And the uh, uh, Korean president uh, about the North Korean issue uh, did uh, say that the comfort moment issue would be put to the side. So I think it's as you say. At the same time, and uh, as I think this is related to what Professor Kim said, there is the international community and uh, some people may uh, raise some differences, and it's probably linked to what you have just said. At the same time, what Professor Kim was saying is that uh, 20 years, or it's uh, to be more precise, about 10 years, over the comfort woman issue, the support organizations have been making appeals to the UN and the American Congress, and then to Canada and uh, Europe. Uh, there was uh, some sympathy. And then uh, in terms of priority, maybe it's gone down a bit, but uh, what you said, it is separate from what you said. I think there is the linkage. I think so. I think uh, that should be kept in mind. And that is linked to your the second question. It's true that there are people who have some doubts. There are both uh, views, for example, uh, the left wing, right wing was mentioned earlier. And uh, some people want to uh, go forward to prioritize the economy and uh, poli uh, politics and economy. And uh, they criticize these support groups. So there is that mo kind of move, too. And then there is the perspective. Some people are changing their perspective perspective somewhat, although it's a minority, and I'm uh, wanting to put my expectations there. But uh, whatever the case, uh, there are political reasons or 
different uh, uh, issues of uh, perception, um, and because of that, there are more people changing their minds. But then what happens when the North Korean issue goes away? Probably, still, the comfort woman issue is going to continue. Uh, that's my view. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kawashima. Um, I want to ask uh, uh, Professor Young. The presentation today, the number two of your resume about the reconciliation between Japan and China, which Professor Park had uh, focused on the thin reconciliation, and I think you were talking about the Chinese perspective. And Professor Young, I think you do research on the Japanese perspective too. And in reconciliation study, there are the soldiers that engaged in battle, and after the war, how well, they went to war, and uh, I think uh, their views are focused on in reconciliation. The Japanese soldiers um, going to China in the battlefield, uh, and then after the war, they go to China and do they uh, ha engage in various exchanges, and that was not mentioned today. So. This, within this thin reconciliation, if you take the Japanese uh, perspective, how do you view the uh, exchange efforts by the uh, former Japanese soldiers and their, uh, be, their actions? Uh, and what is the significance in post-war uh, Japanese uh, discourse? And uh, what implications are there for the contemporary times? Or maybe there are no implications. Uh, thank you for your question. Indeed, um, I neglected to mention the Japanese side of the story of the Stinger reconciliation. As has been pointed out, uh, before 1972, there was no formal diplomatic relations between People's Republic of China and Japan. Although in the 60s, there were this uh, LT trade office, a semi-official uh, representation. And before uh, 1957, there were considerable uh, China initiated the so-called uh, people-to-people diplomacy. And you mentioned the roles of those Japanese who had been in China either during the war or even from before the war. And after these people uh, returned to Japan, uh, including those who were designated as war criminals but were treated in a very lenient fashion, I think in response, they... Um, not only uh, many of them admitted they were wrongdoing against the Chinese people, but also they feel that they need to bring China and Japan closer. So many of them work for this uh, Japan-China uh, Friendship Association, work toward the normalization of the two countries. So it's not uh, a coincidence that the two top Japanese politicians who carried out the normalization was People's Republic of China. Prime Minister Tanaka and the Foreign Minister Ohira both were in China during the war. So in that sense, I think also on the Chinese side, the leadership who actually experienced the war find it easier to find a common language with each other. So that raised the question whether indeed time can heal when the you know, war generation or the generation who experienced the conflict who sometimes feel there's a moral obligation to address the conflict pass away from the scene. So I think that really leaves uh, a very serious question. Thank you very much. I believe now that uh, it is time to entertain questions from the floor. Uh, Professor Sakamoto? Earlier, I said that uh, pretend to forget is uh, necessary sometimes in reconciliation. And in the uh, East Asia uh, history development, um, there is uh, the Korean War. And if you look at what happened uh, in terms of uh, changing the perception of East Asia, it's a possibility that uh, uh, that could uh, change. So I want to ask Professor Young, uh, in terms of the impeding the formation of nation state, uh, there is the European colonialism and the Japanese colonialism, and there are various discussions that are possible, but uh, the Korean War, that is 
in terms of the formation of the nation state in Korea had a big influence. So, Professor Young, if you could uh, uh, tell us your views. There was talk of the uh, edu history education, which is necessary, uh, but uh, this uh, Korean war issue between Japan, Korea, and uh, China, or even North Korea, uh, uh, is there is, uh, the possibility of a common history? I think uh, maybe that is going to be difficult, but at any rate, uh, Professor Young, uh, how would you incorporate the Korean War into what you uh, discussed? Um, thank you. I, I'm not a specialist of Korean War, but uh, it, it's possible to point it out that if I borrow uh, Professor Bruce Cummings' argument that it has a lot to do with the colonial period, the migration of many Koreans to Manchuria and to outside the Korean Peninsula, the social dislocations were in a way related to the division and eventual conflict between the North and South Korea. So we cannot cut off the Korean War from the, the colonial, especially wartime uh, mobilization. Um, yes, uh, Korean War uh, is directly responsible for the division of the Korean Peninsula. Um, although that, you know, at the end of World War II, as we know, it was temporarily divided. As far as the historiography in China, interesting enough, um, maybe not looking at the textbook, but looking at the history of the Cold War historians, for example, in the Shanghai East China Normal University, there's a very strong Cold War international studies. And Professor Shen Zhihua, based on Russian documents, have published very empirically oriented work. So on the one hand, you have this official narrative, but I think on certain subjects, such as the Korean War, there is space for different interpretations as to why the war started, what's the Chinese role uh, in this war. Uh, so maybe it's, it's uh, not inconceivable somewhere down the road, uh, this could be a shared historical uh, consciousness or understanding. So Professor, maybe uh, Kawashima-san can correct me. Masunaga uh, studying international politics. My uh, question directed to Professor uh, Hosoya as a uh, uh, diplomatic uh, uh, relations specialist. Uh, the relationship between power and politics you mentioned and uh, the interest, I think, may be a uh, intermediary or a catalyst, uh, such as the international um, national interest or the strategic interest in case of Korean War and so forth. So, interest may be a intermediating variable. And in terms of economic interest, the past um, assistance and aid and the introduction of money and technology from uh, Japan affected the attitude of uh, uh, China vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Japan. And also, currently, there are some economic interests shared in terms of investment and uh, trade. If uh, the politics uh, or the justice is uh, stronger than uh, stronger, and uh, uh, push away the interest. What would be the situation when you um, introduce uh, the interest as a factor, or, or such as strategic uh, interest and economic interest? Then, uh, how would the interest uh, be weighed heavier than the other factors like justice? Uh, thank you for your question. A very important point was made. Uh, Masataka Kosaka, uh, the, uh, the uh, representative uh, international po um, uh, politics uh, scholar in the post-war Japan, and uh, mentioned that the state is the system of uh, uh, power and uh, interest uh, and the uh, diplomatic relationship. And these three are very important uh, and they represent value. 
And these are very uh, important, the reconciliation and the memory and the historical awareness. We tend to look at this from the viewpoint of value only, but how it is related to power and interest, we should uh, uh, look at. And I talked about the power today, but uh, Kang Kimura of Kobe University often says that uh, during the latter part of 1960s, immediately after the national uh, the, the normalization between um, Korea and Japan, the 70% of Korean trade was with the United States and Japan. That was very vital, but the Japanese weight has come down to 6% currently. And the uh, China alone accounts for double the weight of um, uh, U.S. and Japan uh, together in Korean trade interests. So in terms of economic interest for Korea, it's it far more important to build a good economic and trade relationship than that um, uh, with uh, Jap uh, Japan and North Korea. Another factor would be security, and the alliance with uh, the U.S. is also of important, and so they cannot afford to disregard the relationship with the United States, and and uh, including that with um, Japan. Being an international uh, uh, politics uh, specialist, I have to say that three factors are interlinked and at work. So in discussing the history, uh, that may be reflected in a uh, difference in approach uh, between historian and international uh, politics uh, specialist. And from international politics point of view, uh, looking at the history, I always uh, look at uh, the interconnection between uh, the power and the interest as well as value. and. Uh, uh, I appreciate that you made a point of the interest. If, may, uh, if I may add some points, interest is very important, I believe, but this is closer to national interest rather than economic interest. Now, support, assistance, ODA, economic cooperation extended by Japan is something that I have raised. But from the Chinese point of view, from 1949 to the 50s, there was this China-Soviet Union alliance. And in this coastal region of China, or the, uh, the Amu River uh, development or redevelopment was never discussed. And uh, the coastal region, of course, was taken up by uh, the Soviet Union. And uh, because of the existence of uh, North Vietnam, uh, what used to be uh, asserted as a territory uh, by Chan Kai-shek had been narrowed. And uh, with the existence of natural resources, there was this narrative based on history that was attached afterwards uh, to what was discussed between the two countries. And this, of course, is based on national interest and how power would be affected uh, with the con consideration of interest is something that uh, we have observed in the process uh, in the past. Hamamura uh, from University of Tokyo, and I have a question to Professor Park. I know very little about Korea, but for example, in Korea, it seems that many people are critical about the response of Japan uh, about the comfort women issue. And those people who are dissatisfied and have critical thoughts, have they taken this issue as an issue of their own dignity or human rights? Or those people in Korea who really criticize Japan of how Japan interprets and perceives history thinks that Japan is the source of threat of national security. So what is the source of their concern? I 
believe that how history is perceived would be affected by the attitude of whether or not people are really prepared to really directly and squarely face the issues that had taken place in the past and protection of human rights, for example, maybe uh, the excuse or at least the context given in this conflict that is raised over how countries perceive history. So is it that people think that Japan does not have sufficient remorse over the Japanese rule in Korea or in the Korean Peninsula, or is this uh, taken as a security-related issue? That's a very difficult question. Well, uh, there's a great variety of people, so I cannot generalize the thoughts of people in Korea. But basically, people, people are trying to engage in this human rights movement. Uh, that should not be questioned. But considering the political reality, uh, they're affected by the changing environment. Well, in part, that is true. The support group of comfort women uh, is involved in this human rights movement, and uh, they are also involved in this anti-Japanese campaign and also uh, against opposing against the Japan-U.S. alliance. And also, they are, of course, involved in the movements against North Korea. But uh, the movement or the research that has been carried out up to now, putting aside whether uh, the people are willing to maintain what they have asserted in the past. I think these people have such mindset. And I told you earlier that we have to think about why, the reason. So there was this atrocity uh, committed by Japan and China or in Korea, but that to recognize that is not enough. So those military personnel, the male soldiers in their 20s uh, have committed atrocity on these very young girls for sexual slavery. And uh, I do believe that they were really affected by the, uh, the collectivism and also uh, the modern day values. And why such a situation had arisen is uh, something that we really have to consider in depth. And I'm sorry, I have been quite illogical, but what people have been talking about is not enough. We have to think about other aspects that I have raised and about this uh, human rights violation issue. Is this comfort woman uh, the violation of human rights? They talk about discrimination against women or human rights by being violated. That is not directly raised in uh, Korea. But could this be recognized as a fundamental violation of human rights from the very beginning? I wonder whether that is, was possible. So thank you very much. With this, uh, we need to bring part three to a close. Reconciliation and nationalism was the theme of uh, this panel discussion. And I think we had a very in-depth discussion. And uh, the discussion that followed the initial round of presentation was also very fruitful. And 
Uh, the questions raised uh, by Dr. Kitaoka was repeatedly taken up in the pursuant discussion sessions. And what I was interested especially was, for example, as mentioned by Dr. Park, uh, the role being played by the media and how they uh, affect the perception of history. That was uh, very interesting. And in the interest of time, we couldn't have an in-depth discussion. And this is also an issue related to education. Uh, Professor Kawashima uh, talked about this gap that uh, exists uh, between the state-of-the-art historical research and uh, the perception of history in the general public. How this can be uh, filled is something that we need to continue thinking about. And I thank you very much for the very uh, uh, productive discussion. Thank you very much. The moderator and panelists of uh, part three a panel discussion, please go back to your seat on the floor. At the uh, conclusion of the symposium, uh, the president of JIIA, Ambassador Nogami, to give you closing remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for taking part in this symposium today for uh, long hours. We devoted the whole day today. The history is a very um, serious, heavy issue, but something we should not uh, evade. This is the issue of uh, great importance. And uh, it may sound like a self uh, appraisal, but um, uh, I, we are very gratified that we had a very high quality discussion. And so, in, to that, in that sense, I should like to express my profound appreciation to all the contributors, uh, the uh, moderators, and the panelists, and the audience. As was pointed out during the discussion in this symposium, as Professor Kitaoka mentioned, when it comes to history, we have to study further uh, and pursue the facts further. And uh, the gap between the history research and the society and public opinion and try to fill that gap as was mentioned toward the end. So this symposium is part of such efforts to fill the gap. And at the same time, we like to transmit the message and the fact, and the historic uh, uh, study and the research uh, book, um, research results done in uh, Japanese language, but uh, try to disseminate that to outside, and also to uh, continue the study further, uh, participated by the specialists and researchers from both inside and outside of our country. And uh, we have a many visiting fellows uh, from outside to JIIA. And we have a uh, program. And we are preparing the physical facility to accommodate such uh, fellows from outside so that we can further advance uh, the study on history with the participation of not just the Japanese researchers, but from outside, and uh, try to see how much we can further contribute to public discourse, and also how best we can fill the gap and disparity between the research results and the public opinion and the society, and how to disseminate the research results to widely outside. These are three pillars we uphold, and we'd like to continue these efforts for the um, coming for coming five years. It is a long-lasting um, effort, and it is a living uh, uh, creature. And when, with the change in the background and situation, uh, the reality may change. But we like to continue to do our best in addressing what uh, we should uh, 
direct our attention to. We like to ask for your support and cooperation. In addition to various programs, programs we conduct in Japan, we are planning to have uh, programs outside of Japan as well. And if you visit uh, the website. Uh, on the internet, uh, uh, these programs uh, and the outcomes are made uh, clear, and I hope you will continue to follow our efforts and take part. Thank you very much for your participation over long hours. Thank you very much. With this, we like to bring the symposium to a close. The receiver sets for um, some attention interpretation. Please leave them on your uh, chair. Thank you. Thank you very much for your participation.